Dette er Hartvig og jeg. Vi skal til Midtvesten for å besøke den norske Amerika. Det er godt kjent i Norge at nordmenn har dratt til statene siden det tidlige 1800-tallet. I dag bor det ca. 4,5 millioner norske amerikanere i USA. De fleste bor i den øvre Midtvesten, Illinois, Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota og Dakotaene. Alt er grønt, men vi kjører rundt en av de tørreste sommerene på mange år. I småbyene er det mange tegn på norsk innvandring. Norske gavebutikker. En liberal bruk av ordet viking i enhver sammenheng. Velkommen skilt er å se overalt. Første stopp på ruten er et sted med det indianske navnet Okonomowoc. Her organiseres sju lag stevne. En tradisjonsrik samling for ulike lag av norske amerikanere. Basically, we are seven different groups of people from various parts of Norway. Uh, we're from Toten, we're from Telmark, from Hadeland, Land, um, Sigdal, uh, Romeriki, and I can't think of the fifth, seventh one right now. A hundred years ago, when most of these logs were formed, 
the purpose was to get people from their little valley back together so that um, they could um, to speak the language as it was spoken in their valley. Because in Norway, every little nook and corner had its own little dialect. Um, the logs kind of died out during the Second World War. There wasn't enough guys around, to, you know, and you couldn't travel and you didn't have gas, and so they kind of really died out. None of them really kept going, but in the late 70s and 80s, they started to revive this thing. Um, things were different then. Um, nobody wanted to speak Norwegian anymore because nobody knew how. So Norwegian is kind of dying out. Før vi dro ut, hadde vi snakket med Sverre Mørkhagen, forfatter og ekspert på den norske Amerika-utvandringen. Jeg vil si at eh, norske amerikaner, de norske innvandrerne i Amerika, har klart sig rimelig godt. Eh, de har ord på sig for å være rettskaftende og til å stole på, og så videre. Eh, og det har varit med på å gör dem som grupp till en rimlig vällyckad del av det amerikanska samhället. De är er nog mer amerikaner än de är er men inför sin amerikanske identitet så så håller de starkt på den norska amerikanska som skiljer dem från andra amerikanere. Och det tror jag det är er väldigt bevisst. Stämne i Okonomowoc är er vi sende, och vi ska vidare. Nej. Okej, okay, helt som förväntat. Jag syns det. Jag syns grig hur han är. Vi drar norrväst till Madison, huvudstaden i Wisconsin. Här ska vi träffa D. Grimsrud, president i den lokala logen av Sons of Norway. These decorations were left over from uh, our Sittenemai celebration that we had. So, oh, cobweb. I'm Dee Grimsrud, and I'm the president of Eden Lodge. Just started in January, and my goal as president is to revitalize our lodge. We're having um, Mem- losing a lot of members, we're having a hard time getting new members. This is not just us, and my goal is to change things enough so that we get more people involved in what we're doing. When the immigrants came over, their families sort of kept the I- the image of Norway frozen in time, and so when you come here, you see. Um, a lot of traditional things that you don't see in your daily lives. It's becoming less and less um, pertinent and relevant to um, people's lives. And besides, they're marrying into Germans and other, you know, everybody's just American now. And some of us will always consider ourselves Norwegian Americans, even if we're six, eight generations removed from Norway, but that's that's what we identify with. I don't know who my children are going to identify, you know, what country and their background, because instead of being 50% Norwegian, there are only 25 or 12 and a half or six and, you know, whatever. Ja, for det første så er jo de klubbene, de er jo særlig sånn som Norway. Det fantes andre organisationer også som er bygget opp etter idealer som var väldigt populære i sin tid i det amerikanske samfunnet. Sønner av Norge, som det het, det var et så godt navn at det etter hvert slo an blant de sterkere norske gruppene sør og øst for Minneapolis, så det tog ikke mange år før de også startet Sønner av Norge-klubber, og sånn begynte det. Nu er det jo en organisation på en cirka 60 000, men de har varit oppe i hvert fall det dobbelte, og det er en kjempesuksess i det amerikanske samfunnet. Det er knappt noe annet land som har en, en tilsvarende organisation. Så kommer Torskeklubben, som er nok en sobrere 
del av de norska grupperna som önskar och eh, ge sig själv en identitet som det och därmed så hever de sig nog lite över den eh, sånn som Norway delen av eh, norska amerikanerna. Sending her for Ringer Ricker. Uh, Eric B. Wood uh, near us in Nor Norway. Okay. <laughs> when I was uh, a young boy growing up on the farm, uh, I was surrounded with uh, Norsk, uh, with Norwegian people. Um, my grandparents lived right over the hill. My mother's parents lived three or four miles down the road. My mother's father was from in the buck. I guess the kicker, if you will, was I would walk into my grandparents' home as a little boy, and they would immediately go into Norwegian, talking Norwegian. And they knew I couldn't understand them. And when I was about seven or eight or nine years old, my father's mother, who lived just over the hill, asked me, you really do want to learn Norwegian, don't you? And I said, yes, I do. So she sat me down at her kitchen table and taught me the ABCR um, idiomer, flere er med idiomer, og det norsk borben. Ja, vi elsker, og i es og naven går vi til bors. Og spise og drikke på ditt ord. Det er Gud til ære, oss til gaven, så får vi mat i es og naven. So I went from what I refer to in my life as my unconscious appreciation to once I got away from home and started following up on the language, the culture, everything I could get my hands on to read, I moved into what I call my conscious appreciation. Oh, horre heite føre kveite. Vi kjører vest til et sted som heter Little Norway. Her var det en gang en norsk farm ute på prærien. I dag er det hele et slags museum, privat eid av norsk-amerikaneren Scott Winner og familien hans. What we have here is the largest collection of Norwegian artifacts that's privately owned outside of Norway. And uh, the building behind me was built right outside Trondheim in Erk Anger. It was brought to America 119 years ago for the World's Fair in Chicago in 1893, after the World's Fair was over. This building, by the way, was named the most ornate building at the World's Fair, and they had a Sut in the Mai, a Constitution Day celebration in Chicago for this building. Us Norwegian Americans take these old traditions that were brought over by our immigrant families from Norway to America and we do not let those traditions change. We hold on to them and pass them down from generation to generation. We're Norwegian Americans a lot of times have been stuck in time to preserve what their ancestry means to them. Fra Little Norway kan man kjøre nordvest med Route 14. Flate åker med mais blir etter hvert ekupert terreng. Vi tar turen innom Vestby, en liten småby. Her treffer vi på Clayton, en norsk-amerikansk tobakkbonde. Jeg oh, er Clayton Lee, en old Norwegian. Jeg er 88 år gammel. And I had the 
She's seven brothers and four sisters. Used to be a farmer, raised a lot of tobacco. Mange norske bønder begynte tidlig med tobakk i Wisconsin. Det var en god måte å tjene penger på. Med bare et par gode avlinger kunne en bonde kjøpe sin egen farm og være fri og uavhengig. Vi drar videre fra Vestby. Vi kjører gjennom Kuhn Valley i retning av et sted som heter Norskedalen. Man skjønner rast hvorfor nordmennene dro hit. Åskammene og smådalene er annerledes enn resten av prærien. Det hele kan ha minnet om gamle landet. This is Norskedalen Nature and Heritage Center. Uh, we're about 25 years old of about 400 acres and we are here to preserve and interpret the cultural and natural heritage of the area. Uh, we were primarily started as a nature center to um, teach about the environment uh, to the university in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Then they realized that the farms that were in the area needed to be preserved and interpreted also. They were disappearing, the old buildings, especially the log buildings, and the Norwegian buildings specifically because Norskedalen means Norwegian Valley. We can actually go back in archaeology and show that we had Indians, Native Americans, living here 13,000 years ago. And so we have a long history of people living here up until 1853 when uh, the very first family that lived in the area was the Skumsrud family, um, Nels Skumsrud, who immigrated from Norway and uh, built a log cabin just a, about three miles from here. Um, when he arrived here, he had an interaction with the Native Americans at that time, a good interaction. They helped each other out. Indians taught the pioneers different farming methods, what to grow as far as corn, squash, beans, that kind of thing. And when times got tough for the, the Native Americans, as far as the land was disappearing, they no longer had places to stay, um, the Norwegian pioneers allowed them to stay and camp on their, their farmsteads. And some of the Norwegian farmers actually have um, photographs and diary excerpts and interviews that tell of these stories, how they camped on their, their farmsteads in the summertime, how on cold winter nights they allowed them to stay in their cabins with them, how they traded beadwork for bread, and so on. It was a very good interaction right up into the 1930s. So um, it's, a, it's a story that's often not told. Vi kjører inn til La Crosse ved Mississippi-elven. I byen treffer vi en indianer som leter etter familien sin. Ok, my name is Klau Vang Cruz, and I'm from Chicago, but I came up here to Wisconsin to find some of my relatives that are Indian. By me being native, and another culture, you know, which I have, uh, you know, the, I have uh, evidently Polish in me, 
I have Italian in me, I have Hungarian, and then I'm native. So with all those four together, I feel out of place. I feel like there's no uh, hope for me in some parts because of the way that uh, the history went down in my family. And I am very disappointed, I'm hurt, I'm upset, um, I'm frustrated every day because I, I, I see how the world is. It's a cruel world. And they have no, no principles and morals and set, they didn't set no standards in life. And they still call me, uh, oh, look at that, uh, that freaking Indian or look at, uh, look, at, look at the way he looks and why is he here? This is our country. <coughs> Excuse me, well, it's not your country. It's all of our countries, and I was born here just as well as you are. But one thing I know is when you cut a piece of our layer of skin, we all have the same, the same uh, meat and blood. Neste sted vi skal til er sørvest over delstatsgrensen til Iowa, og ned til en liten by som heter Decora. Her arrangeres festivalen Nordic Fest hvert år. Jeg heter Ethan Bjelland. Jeg kommer her fra Decora, Iowa. Det er Nordic Fest i dag, som er et stort stort festival eh, for eh, norsk ett och eh, norsk arv, skandinaviska arv eh, i Decora. Um, så egentligen vi får massa massa människor från andra andra delar eh, utöver hela landet och av och till från Norge och så kommer hit eh, vår by som är 8000 människor eh, blir till som 16 000 i bara, bara en dag, eller tre dagar. This is my third visit to Victoria. Uh, I was uh, here the first time in 2008 that we have a celebration of that 17th of May. And I play at uh, this Nordic Fest last year too. And I'm very, very, very happy to be here. I start with a song that you know, Home, Home on the Ranch, and in Norwegian, Yen, Yen, Blanc, Mogu. You're welcome. Det, det blev många gånger att jag blev det var många gånger att jag blev väldigt väldigt sint och uh, frustrerad uh, med med norska amerikaner här Sally Nordic Fest och allt det här Når man snakker om norske amerikanere og norsk amerika, det blir litt, litt, litt taken advantage av, kan man si, eller kulturen her som er norsk amerikansk, norsk amerikansk, er egentlig veldig, veldig annerledes. Det betyr noe nu stort för de som är här för att få de förbindelserna de förbindelserna med uh, med Norge men det är inte det samma. Jag tror jag tror um, jag tror det det blir mer 
får mennesker her å ha norsk Amerika i hjertet, i hjertet, i hjertet, i hjertet, i hjertet. Det er vel ikke til å komme forbi at de dyrker et annet Norge enn det vi har. De er, de er ikke oppdatert på det norske samfunnet, så det de dyrker er sine besteforeldres Norge. Og de er faktisk ganske flinke. Vi skal ikke se bort fra. Vi skal ikke overse det at de tar vare på rosmalingstradisjonen i større grad enn vi gjør her i Norge var en tur innom, på en av turene mine og innom eh, Vesterheim museet i eh, Decorah i Iowa. Og kommer inn i et rom, og der står det da en kai fra Valdres og underviser en gruppe på en 15-20 mennesker i rosmaling. Det har ikke jeg opplevd i Norge. Fra Decorah drar vi videre nord og tilbake inn i Wisconsin. Ute i skogen ved byen Eau Claire holdes det en sommerleir for norsk-amerikansk ungdom. Den heter Masse Moro. We've been uh, at this camp. This is our 34th year. And this is at the uh, Eau Claire County uh, Beaver Creek Reserve Youth Camp that we convert to Norway, if you will, for our two weeks stay here every summer. And as you can hear in the background, they're learning some Norwegian songs right now. And we do that every year. This happens to be their most favorite time, actually, the, uh, the All Song, when they, they get together every day. And, uh, of course, they learn Norwegian as well, which we, this is not a language camp necessarily, but we think that having a Norwegian language is very basic to what they do here at camp. There's a kind of a magic here for the enthusiasm. You can tell just by what's going on here that they take that back to their lodges and continue and look forward to coming back next year so that they, in fact, will, will get steeped and engaged in their Norwegian culture. I was a camper here, too, when I was a kid. So, I mean, I've been coming to this camp since 1995. Um, and this is, I think, my fifth year as a counselor. And in addition to that, I do the t-shirts and stuff. But um, a lot of the songs and, and all of the activities sort of just stay with you over the years like you'll come back on the first day and and we'll do all song or whatever and the and all the words to the songs will just sort of come back to you even if it's been a few years since you've been back they just sort of resurface and i think it's because we do things so many so many times you know every day you saw our time plan it's very very full <laughs> Koob is a game with lots of wooden sticks and blocks and you have um, a long stick and you have to throw it to try to knock down the other person's um, king koob and then eat their little um, uh, pieces of wood I guess and so you're just trying to knock down the other people's um, pretty popular game with the kids. Um, troll hunt is pretty popular. We the counselors typically have to dress up really silly and stupid and make fools out of ourselves, but the kids enjoy it. So one year I dressed up as a troll and I think I hid in the tree way over there and they had to hold hands and get in a group and then capture me and I was this crazy troll. Well, my dad comes from a family that's 100% Norwegian. His mom's dad came directly from Norway and then um, his other grandparents came from Norway ahead of that, but um, he lived in Norway for a summer at Oslo International Summer School in 1975 and kind of just got really excited from there, started learning more about our genealogy. Um, he joined Sons of Norway 
that year after he got back, so he was 25 years old, and he moved up pretty quickly. But I think it wasn't until I lived in Norway did I really want to become more involved with Sons of Norway and knowing that I'm getting married soon and I'm going to have children and I want this to get passed down. And um, I don't want to push my children, but I want it to seem normal that you know, we are Norwegian, this is important to us, and I don't want to forget that. So um, it was never a forced issue to, you need to learn your heritage, you need to um, go to Norwegian camp. Um, it just seemed like the right thing to do, and I hope that kids now don't forget about their heritage, no matter what they are, if they're German or Italian or what. I think it's extremely important to know where you come from. My dad definitely was a huge um, part of that for us children because we are all still very involved and we want to carry that down to our children. So um, I'm very thankful for that. Vi kör in i Minnesota, skipper förbi storbyarna St. Paul och Minneapolis eller The Twin Cities. Vi drar flera hundra mil långt norr. Som chaufför börjar Hartvig och följa lite på avståndet. Det är jävligt slitigt alltså. Och det är förresten Lars som har fått oss med upp hit alltså så förgör liksom där var det längst att köra vars som möjligt liksom så här bara allt det här var lite helvete liksom. Så tack ska du ha. Sorry Hartvig. Ja, det är en fin solnedgång då. Ja, vi ser dem alla. Fin solnedgång. Ja, fin kur. Det är Midge är en av huvudbyarna i norra Minnesota. Vi kommer rast i kontakt med de lokala norskamerikanerna som bor där uppe. No, she's a fjord. She, she loves Fjords. people. Yeah. Oh. Just so that's rude and people don't like it. <laughs> Here. Here. Here's this little. Haha. My name is Lois Egelhoff, Lois Jakobsen Egelhoff. Um, I don't originally come from Bemidji. We moved here 15 years ago. But uh, both my parents were Norwegian Americans. My mother's family, her parents came here. My grandfather was a ship's captain and they ended up in New York City. And uh, my father's family came here in 1850 and 1852 and they settled in Scandinavia, Wisconsin. I know it must be difficult for people in Norway to understand since you have family there, you're always there. But the first time I stepped on the family farm, it was, holy mackerel, 15 people left this little couple of acres with these huge mountains, so they're not going to be seeing the sun for five months out of the year because it, it doesn't dip below that mountain on the south side. And how could they survive before? And yet I met the relatives because people stayed. But three generations and 15 people left to find a new home. And land was so precious in Norway that having free land, you will keep moving. And if you talk to some of the people here, you will find the amazing stories of people living for a year or two years in a sod house and out on the prairie. But they had land, and that was something that really people treasured. And when they came here, they came here before our Civil War. And uh, I don't know if people have talked to you about the heavy involvement of the Norwegian immigrants in our Civil War. That they, my, I don't know how many grades back, grandpa, the, the old man who came, told his sons and his sons-in-law, grandsons-in-law, aid beats you. You have to go fight the slave Kriegen the Slav Kriegen, and so they did. Five of them, did, okay, that's what we're supposed to do, and they did it. And so they took on that part of this country, but it was also part of themselves, because they did not want to be the poor, the downtrodden, the slaves. Uh, Normen deltok i den amerikanske borgerkrigen faktisk i større grad enn uh, gjennomsnitt av amerikanere. Og det spennende her er jo at det ser ut väldigt tydlig för mig att det klara engagemanget på nordstadssidan det uppstod bland haugianerna. Haugianerna sa 
Ingen har rätt till att äga ett annat menneske. De var helt klare på att alltså slavehåll var nog ukristligt, de skulle inte ha något. Och haugianerna var en väldigt stark och väldigt dominerande grupp i bland de tidiga utvandrarna till Amerika. Vi ska i kyrka och träffa några norska amerikanere. Rodnes Lutheran Church ligger norrväst för Bemidji. Och menigheten är er väldigt upptatt av sina norska aner. We are so proud of our Norwegian history. Um, this part of the state was settled by Norwegians and, and Germans and, and people of Protestant faith. Um, and so it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the predominant uh, Christian churches here are Lutheran. I, I'm, I manage a bank, for example, and we, we do banking with people all over the United States. They like to invest their money up here because they trust Minnesotans. <laughs> I think that it's, it's an area that's known for our honesty and, and, and loyalty and, and, um, and, and hard work. We, we enjoy our right to bear arms and, and our freedoms and independence uh, a lot. And I think that came a lot from, you know, the people that came from Europe and, and Scandinavia didn't want to be told what to do and they didn't want to, they, want, they wanted to be able to control their own destiny. One time I have a funny story. We visited in Sweden at my mother's side, her relatives, and <clears throat> then we rode with them to meet uh, the, my Norwegian relatives, and we were right on the border when we met, and I could introduce them to one another. And then they had me climb a hill and step one foot on Norway, one on Sweden, and they took my picture. <laughs> well, on my side, uh uh, Lefse is, yeah. is a tradition. That's true. Um, Lefse and flatbread. Yes. Without being there, Dad, when you think of Norway, what do you think of? Well, I don't know. Did your dad talk about it? Never did. He never mentioned Norway. I, I think that happened to a number of the immigrants, they, um, many of them left family members. And, he never mentioned about going back. You know, uh, they, I think to talk about it was painful. And many of them never kept contact with their family. In fact, when I went the first time in 1969, he didn't know if I had family over there. <laughs> And so when I got to Norway, I took every phone catalog from across the country and wrote to every trandom or called them on the phone, uh, hoping to find a, a relative, and I did. But why is it so hard to talk about? Uh, be, for the early immigrants? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's because they, many of them knew they would never be back. And uh, many of them left uh, parents or grandparents. Uh, and, uh, and, and for many of them, I think it was a very, very difficult life over there. And, and I think some of them were relieved to, to be in this area where they gave them land for almost nothing uh, with the Homestead mm -hmm. Act. Uh, was it 160 acres? We only had 100. Oh. Uh, it, that would be 400 mole. And um, all they had to do was farm it for five years and pay about $5, I think, in, in fees. And it was their well, land. Why didn't they homestead up by Grand Forks instead of <laughs> off the woods and the lakes? I think this reminded them of Norway. I know. This area. Homestead loven gjorde at nybyggerne kunne få rett til 160 acres, eller 647 dekar med land. Etter fem år fikk de full eiendomsrett. I dag er en del av farmene rundt Minnesota fortsatt eid av familiene til de første homestederne. This is where uh, I was born, right in that house. And uh, the reason I took you here is because uh, this whole piece of land here, uh, going all the way through to the next highway, when we go leave here, we'll drive by there. Uh, my grandpa owned all this except this farm. My father ended up buying this farm. And uh, my grandpa came over here in the late or uh, early 1800s and homesteaded that farm. And he was quite a farm. He had quite a, 
quite a place. And he ended up with uh, doing over 600 acres of farming. He had about 600 acres of land. Let's go over and I said, uh, it's t fallen down, but that was the sure. homestead Gunstein Olsen lived in. That's right, yep. So I would say <laughs> these houses were built around the 1918. Somewhere because, in there, yep. yep, somewhere in there. We had a barn that uh, stood right over here. Uh-huh. And uh, that was the milk house. That's right. Where we used to put the, the milk in that shed right there. Mm -hmm. We're just saying, even like my grandpa's farm, there's not a house on it today, and it was a beautiful farm. It was a beautiful place. Probably one of the nicest in Polk County. It was. It had beautiful buildings. It had a, a barn with a horse barn on one side. Did you tell mm -hmm. them about no. that? And then the cow barn was on the other side. And then there was a hay mow in between. And they were quite modern because they even had a track for the manure with a manure bucket on a track that went from the one barn to the other in a circle. And my brother and his cousin used to tip that upside down and push it and ride it around. <laughs> they thought yeah. that was fun. Yeah. And uh, Grandpa, when he was uh, working in the woods, he hurt his hip. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. And he had a limp. All the while I remember him, he limped. But he got around and did a lot of things. And I remember my grandpa sitting in the dining room by the table, and he would sing Kandu Glemma Gumla Norga, and the tears would go down his cheeks. And I'd say, Grandpa, how come you cry when you talk, sing about Norway? And he said, because it was so beautiful, and I never will get back there. It was because of that uh, accident in the woods. No. He never got back. And that was his dream, I think, that maybe someday he could. And uh, let's see, I used to walk through these woods barefoot a lot of times to come up here and have supper with, because Kermit's mother was such a good cook. Well, actually, my mom was too, too but, but anyway. When I was born, uh, I was born right on the farm in the bedroom here. Det var ikke alle norskamerikanere som ville bli bønder. Vi drar til Thief River Falls, Det er rundt halvparten av innbyggerne har norske aner. Min great-grandfather emigrerte fra South Trøndelag i 1895. Han var den eldste, og han ga opp sin bøtterett til å komme til Norge. Da jeg gikk tilbake og visitte den små farm, han og brødre og søstre var på en just like every other Norwegian farmer, small, very little, very little land. And he had a friend that uh, went a couple of years be ahead of him and then wrote back and said, told him about the wondrous things that um, the United States had to offer. And so his friend helped purchase the ticket and he came over and worked with his friend on a farm near Appleton, Minnesota. But he didn't like the farm and I, I've asked the question, why did he leave? Um, obviously, because of America had its its draw, but I think it's the fact that he just didn't want to farm anymore. I think he just, to him, that meant so you know the uh, drudgery and the life of constant struggle. And so, as soon as he paid his his uh, passage back, he went to work at the mill. My grandfather spoke only Norwegian until he was his first day of, of school. And then when he went to school, he couldn't speak English and was reprimanded because of that. And this was right around the time of the First World War and where it was very, it was looked down upon if you were un-American. There came a reaction around the First World War i det amerikanske samfunnet, hvor de går under begrepet nativism, altså innfødthet, hvor det oppstod et krav om å være amerikanere. De skulle ikke ha noe mer av den der bindestreksnasjonaliteten, som de kalte det. Norske amerikanere, engelske amerikanere, irske amerikanere. Alle skulle være amerikanere, og dermed skulle de snakke engelsk. I denne propagandaen så var det mange, hvis ikke de fleste nordmenn, de stilte seg da på den republikanske siden, altså mot dette med bindestreks nasjonalitet, og mot 
de nye inkommerne som hadde da begynt å prege det amerikanske samfunnet på måter som de gamle ikke likte. Så, så i den grad det norske språket forsvant ut av bruk blant nordmenn, så var nordmennene selv også med på det. Vi drar sørover langs med grensen til North og South Dakota. Hartvig og jeg har kjørt rundt i samme bil i flere uker nå, og det fører til diskusjoner om det meste. De sender ikke fisk med... De, det er ikke, du sender ikke bare mennesker i en båt, du sender ting. Det kan være en stor... De sendte ikke fisk med den båten. Piano. De sendte også fisk. Ja, de sendte piano. Det var fiskekris i Europa på den tiden her. De hadde nei, ikke fisk. Nei, altså, Amerika-båten, den frakta mennesker, ikke fisk. Sørvest i Minnesota ligger byen Wilmar, der vi skal treffe norsk-amerikaneren Richard Hengan. This is the, the, the site of my great-great-grandparents' farm. Uh, the house that we see up there was his original house. He, the first winter or two, they lived in a, in a dugout in the ground, and they built a frame house. And it was a very typical farm. The, the, the mother on the farm passed away around the turn of the century, so the boys grew up without a mother around. This was the classic location and example of Norwegian bachelor farmers. Uh, in Minnesota, there's sometimes there's jokes that there's a lot of Norwegian bachelor farmers, and these were really classics. There were three brothers that I knew, and they were all very ingenious. One of them took care of all the farmland. Another brother took care of the animals on the farm, and he fixed electric motors. And those two brothers wouldn't speak with each other. They had their own lives, but the go-between was a third brother who was born retarded. And so if the clothes ever got dirty, he would uh, be responsible for washing them, and he'd fix the meals. I was on this farm at least monthly all the time growing up. I was never in the main house, but I was in the shop many, many, many times. Many stories of the immigrants I, I heard in, in, at this place. Uh, my father would, they'd start talking, and many times it would be a Norwegian, and if I'd ever say anything, it always automatically switched to English. But I could usually follow the stories as they would tell them in Norwegian. And, and over the years, it was often the same stories told over and over. Før vi drar videre, tar Richard oss med til Guri Endresons hytte, som i dag ligger godt bortgjemt ute i skogen. Guri og familien hennes kom til Amerika i 1857 og bosatte seg her ute. Under Dakota-krigen ble det utsatt for et indianerangrep. Mannen hennes Lars og sønnen Endre ble skutt ned utenfor hytta. Guri unnslapp med livet og fikk skrevet ned sine erfaringer. Jeg er helt overbevist om at mange fikk et stort sjokk. De kom til en virkelighet som ikke de var forberedt på. Det er helt umulig å beskrive dette her. Og det de ble presentert for var jo propaganda. Fordi at de som hadde reist over allerede, de ønsket seg jo at det skulle komme flere. Og der ute var det altså en, det var ville vesten. Det var forhold som de overhovedet ikke var forberedt på. Med lovløshet, kamp om for tilværelsen. Og jeg har begynt å lure på om det er en av grunnene til at nordmennene har søkt sammen i så stor grad som de har gjort. Fordi at det virker jo som de i større grad enn andre folkegrupper har samlet seg om sin nasjonale historie, sin nasjonale bakgrunn og organisert seg faktisk på forskjellige måter inn i denne tradisjonen. Vi treffer norsk-amerikaneren Jason for å samle oss om noen øl fra Grimstad. 
Tror du det er for Grinstad? Ja. Har du, har du... Har du misfunnet med de norske, norske gjestene dine som skulle være så bare drakk opp alle øl din? Nei, nei, nei. De var veldig tørste, de var ikke det. Vi har sagt dem at noen ganger så er de norske amerikanerne frosset i ti da, på den måten at fordi før så var nordmenn mye mer kristne enn hva vi er nå. Men jeg tror at de norske amerikanerne som er her i Amerika er mye mer kristne enn hva nordmenn er nå. Ja, men jeg tror også at du har bare kommet i kontakt med det eldste norske amerikanere, og det er fortsatt sant. Men i min generasjon og hundre, det er mer som Norge, vi er ikke så avhengige av kyrken og sånt. Ja, det er helt sant. Ja, men vi skal alle dra til hjem, kanskje. Skål, snuvær. Er ikke det herlig? Skål. Ja, det beste vi kan gjøre når vi tuer folk, det er bare rett og slett skjenken en drit av fulle. Det er det som er hemmelig. Egentlig synes jeg alle amerikanere burde lære å snakke norsk, da. Jeg synes at nå er det jo utrolig mange amerikanere i... Nei, men nordmenn i Amerika. Og nå har det vært der ganske lenge, så det er liksom det er på grensen hvor lenge, eller liksom hvor lang tid skal du ta før at dere amerikanere, alle amerikanere, lærer å snakke norsk? Heldigvis, da norsk innvandrere kom fra 100 år siden, 150 år siden, de har grunnlagt seks colleges her i Midtvesten, St. Olaf, Luther og så videre, og de fortsetter, og som lenge som jeg vet, alle seks er ganske sterk, og det er mulig å studere norsk og sant, men det er ikke så populært for ungdom for å fokusere på norsk språk og kultur og sånn. Så jeg synes at det blir mindre og mindre fremover som kan norsk her i USA. Og det er litt trist. For jeg tror du kan lære mye om et land hvis du kan lære språk. Minneapolis er vårt siste stopp. Byen var en gang målet for de norske immigrantene. Vi derimot må hjem. Dette er bare et knippe små og store fortellinger fra Midtvesten. Historier om et folk på leting etter jord, arbeid og et bedre liv. Et slags minne om alt det som forsvinner fra landet og menneskene. Musikk